Hey, uh, my name is Matty Taus. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at Epiphany, and it is my opportunity for, to be able to share with you a couple of things. Uh, it dawned on me this morning that what God has created Epiphany Station to do and to be is to be a place where we start conversations about what it really means to love God and love people. We don't just come together on a Sunday morning, get all the hard and fast answers, and then just go do as you're told. Like, we start the conversation between us and the Lord. We start the conversation amongst our church family. We start the conversation about loving God and loving people with every single piece of who we are. And so, before I actually start our main conversation for today, I've got something to help you start a conversation. Uh, We ended a teaching series in October called Money Talks, and it was intent and desired around understanding what it means to truly love God with money. This thing that we struggle to talk about, don't want to talk about, and therefore don't often love God and give our heart to God through it. And we had these conversations, and one of the things that I learned throughout them and many other conversations with other people is there is a big area of money that we don't really know as a church how to love God well or, or what to do with it. And that is when it comes to no longer being here, estate planning. And when we die, what will we do with what we have? Who will inherit what we have accumulated on this earth? What I see a lot of the times in the church is not pretty. Uh, We leave behind for our loved ones a lot of confusion, a lot of mess, a lot of opportunity for anger, confusion, and fighting. Uh, Oftentimes, the desires of the person who's passed away don't get fulfilled And sometimes even a lot of the money that they desire to go in one direction is actually goes to something else. And what we wanted to do was empower the church. And so we got in touch with our conference, Converge, and they actually use this resource. And it's a free seminar to us that Converge pays for for the church. And so on the 28th of November at 6 p.m. right here, you can come to a free seminar on understanding how to understand estate planning, how to understand wills and trusts, how to not to leave a mess behind for children and loved ones, but to be able to, to be able to love God and love people with your money. If you want more information about this, you can head to the info desk, and uh, we'd love to see as many there to be able to understand this one way of doing this one thing. Now... I will say this about the conversation to come. We are starting a conversation around something that is heavy and intense and very real that if we had it our way, we would like not to talk about. Our first conversation starting last week in this teaching series, Overcoming Evil, started to show already that this is something that we are not used to. We do not feel prepared for, prepared in. And it's something that actually, if we did, we would be able to love God, give God great glory all the more if we would understand it and overcome evil in all of its forms. Our first conversation was around the beginnings of evil, the the prince of evil, Satan, where he comes from, a very real being with a very real purpose and intent, and given a certain amount of power from God to achieve a certain result, the testing of faith to see if we are genuine. Our next conversation takes that, which is very easy to leave kind of just in the ethereal, that's in the macro, that doesn't deal with me specifically. We take that now into a conversation that God has been preparing me to share with you for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I believe he has you, whether you realize why you're here now, here for this Because you will come into contact with, you will experience, if you're looking, this in your lifetime. I want to have a conversation about demons. I want to have a conversation about what the Bible says. And as we go to the Bible and we go to what Jesus Christ says about demonic influence, demonic oppression, demonic possession, what demons do we would be more prepared to be able to overcome anything and everything that this form of evil would take. Now, as we talk about uh, the demonic, uh, we don't use terms like exorcisms and possessions because they stir up completely the wrong images of what is actually happening in the spiritual. We use terminology like demonic influence and demonic deliverance because this isn't Hollywood. This is something that continues to happen in the church that's been happening for the last 2,000 years and has happened amongst us twice in the last two months. 
And the reason that I want to share this with you is because I actually had a conversation very short with someone in which I shared that I was able to be a part of a demonic deliverance with someone. And I said, huh, I didn't think that still happened. And I think that might be what the majority of us think, that 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 doesn't happen. And yet it does. It's very real. There's a very real need. And it's a very evil intent that demons have over you and your life. And so the goal is to learn who they are, what they are, why they are, to believe in the power that overcomes them and the authority that's been given to us to overcome them. And in that, I want to pray for us before we jump in. Father God, as we shine light in the darkness, I ask that right now in the room, there will be full submission to the authority of Jesus Christ's name, that there's no disruption, there's no distraction, that there is no power that can overcome what you want to do in sharing your word and your truth with people. So God, this morning, I ask that you would open our eyes where we've been veiled and blinded to what is happening with spiritual forces, and when you would show us where it has been, or where it is, or where it might be so that we could bring you immense glory as we walk in your authority to overcome evil in all of its forms. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. The uh, Greek word for demon or evil spirit appears 63 times in the New Testament. Uh, The word dominion, it is in Matthew, it is in Revelation, it's slapped in between all through about very real entities that pose a very real threat to the physical and spiritual lives of people. Dominion, the Greek word, to mean divinities, to mean these oppressive forces outside of the physical, God makes sure you're aware of them so that you can know there's the possibility of them. The times that it is shown up in the Bible to help you understand who, what, where, why, and when, but truly, genuinely, the glory that he is receiving when they're overcome. To understand where demons come from, read this with me. In 2 Peter, God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. Like Satan, demons are sinful angels. Those who, created by God to serve God, chose to rebel and decided to seek to be higher than God himself. There was a fight between angels and demons. Demons lost and they were cast out of heaven. And yet, within God's plan, they still are given an opportunity to influence the world. Satan and demons are given the opportunity to influence the world. Why? So that there can be clear contrast So that there is not large swaths of gray area, but God says, look, there is good and there is evil. There is light and there is dark. And I want you to see that. I want you to have the option of Satan. I want you to have the experiences with demons so that you'll understand who I am and why I'm good. For those of you who are Bible readers, I want to throw up for you in the New Testament um, a lot of the examples of people's interactions with evil spirits and demons. This is where we're talking about uh, influence, oppression, possession. We're talking about exorcism. We're talking about deliverance. And we're talking about Jesus and his words, what he would tell you and why it is important. See, demonic influence is just the result of sin, that they would want what they claim, that we would be different from, apart from, separated from God. And in all those examples of what demons do, what they do is they steal. They steal people's ability to speak, to speak truth, to instead insert lies. They steal people's sight. They take their hearing. They take control of their own bodies. They take their health. They take their mind. They they twist and they distort and they disrupt. They cause fear cause anxiety, cause paranoia, cause confusion. Demons are in the job of driving people apart, driving marriages apart, driving families apart, keeping people isolated from one another, driving them off into the wilderness where they can be easily overcome. Demons are in the business of developing in us irrational hate and rage and fury. Demons are in the work of tempting you with immorality to lead you down the path of destruction and demons are in the business of self-harm 
and self-destruction. What they do is they cause havoc and chaos in the lives of those who are influenced by them. And God would have you know this truth, not so you would live in fear and concern and worry of consistently being overruled and overcome. He would have you hear it and know it and believe it so your eyes would be opened, so you could see what the demons themselves might try and hide from you, so that you could learn, believe, and then in all authority overcome. And God does not share this thing with you so that you might become obsessed in, in the war between angels and demons and everything else that doesn't matter in relation to our salvation. He tells you it so you can have peace because there isn't a fight going on to be won. It's already been won. John 16, Jesus says something definitive. So I've told you all of this. I've told you it so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I throw this pick up here uh, because I see stuff like this on Facebook, and social media all the time. Like this is somehow a representation of what's going on in the spiritual. It's not. Like, that is really, it's really not. I mean, this idea that Jesus is struggling to overcome the devil, it's not true, it's not biblical, it's not theology, it's not doctrine, it's not right. There has been a contest and it's done. It's no longer a contest. Jesus has absolute authority over all creation. So whenever creation comes against him, it loses and this authority he wants you to know about because it's an authority, the only authority that we can rely on to overcome evil. Those of you who are Bible readers or maybe not yet Bible readers, uh, we have a stack of Bibles out at the info desk, free gift to you if you're going to become a Bible reader. As I want you to read uh, Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to share a, a chunk of it, but Matthew chapter 12 has got a lot about this and helping us understand how very real it was to Jesus and why they thought it's so important to record it in history so the church could learn, observe, and overcome. Let me share this chunk with you. It says, Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak was brought to Jesus he healed the man so that he could both speak and see. Now, you would think in a section about demonic possession that that would be the most important part. Like, there'd be more details on that of how and why and when and who. But it's happening so regularly in the ministry of Jesus Christ that it's just, and another one came and another one was healed. Next verse. The crowd was amazed and asked, as all displays of power by Jesus Christ were supposed to do, asking the question, could it be that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah? But when the Pharisees heard about the miracle, they said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. So the Pharisees, these are those who think they know better than everybody else. These are the religious elitists of the day who look down on most others. And they can only consider, they can only fathom that to overcome a bad thing, he must be using a bad thing, fighting fire with fire. So the only argument they have is, oh, it's probably on Satan's team, that's why. Jesus knows their thoughts, and he replied, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And <laughs> if Satan's casting out Satan, he is divided and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. And I, if I'm empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too, so they will condemn you for what you have said. But, and here's the clinch, if I am casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. The work of the demonic in this world is so that Jesus can exercise his authority and so that we would know it, and so that we would see it. It is something so untalked about in the church. I asked as we huddled together for prayer in the morning, about 2025, I said, who here has 
you know, prayed before and, and feels like they've heard an answer to prayer and all the hands go up in the room. So we'll talk about prayer all the time, all day long. I said, who here has experienced demonic influence in their life or the life of the others? And as, just as many hands went up. Yet we shy away from that conversation. God would have us know, therefore the devil doesn't want us to know. God would have us know that we overcome. We overcome evil and it's not even a fight. We carry with us in the church Jesus Christ, the strongest, able to tie, to bind anything evil, anything demonic, to bind it and to plunder his house. The things that the devil seeks to possess is you and us and our soul and our salvation. And Christ says, I'm going, I have what it takes to plunder that house, to redeem that which belongs to the Lord. So he shows this authority demonstratively all the way through the New Testament, through the new church. He proves it. And then he does something, I'm going to say, even more important to us today. He declares that this authority is not just his, but he is going to gift it to the church that the church would have this kind of authority and power so that the world would know and see what real authority is. One of my favorite chunks of Bible is when Jesus prepares the church to go out and do. Like the first disciple, 72, he says, hey, you're going to go and minister the gospel, the good news. Get out there and do it. Before he sends them, he makes them understand one clear thing, and then he receives the report of what they experienced. And I want to share that with you now. He says to the disciples before they go, anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me. Anyone who rejects it is rejecting me. And anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. And then they go and then they come back. And when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them, because I've seen Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Who has authority over everything? Jesus Christ. Who does he give authority to? Those who accept his message. That Jesus Christ is the son of God who came in all power and all perfection to die for our sin and was resurrected and now sits, sits in heaven and authorizes and empowers his church to be like him, to walk in authority like him. Jesus gives over this authority so that we can rejoice knowing him to be true and knowing not just that we have power over demons, knowing that our names are registered in heaven, which matters all the more. So all power is given to the citizens of heaven so that they can have proof to strengthen the church, but then also so an unseeing world would see what God truly, genuinely wants to do. Now, I would be remiss and unwise not to share with you two scriptural warnings when it comes to engaging the demonic that we have to take seriously. Otherwise, it can go very badly. Jesus shares the first one. And he shares it in Matthew 12, because you're all going to go read Matthew 12, so you'll see it there. In Matthew 12, here's something you really need to be concerned about, is if the individual that you're casting demons out of is not ready to receive me, receive my message, accept my message, that I would come and take residence within them, the concern will be that demons will be sent out, and they will just come back. All the stronger... And all the worse for that individual. You see, it's actually the belief in Jesus Christ of the individual who's being delivered that is most important. The second warning that he gives is given actually in the book of Acts in which an example is given. Believers cast out demons through the book of Acts. And then in 19, there's this particular chunk in which there's some Jewish guys going around, seven brothers. And they are exorcists. And they go from town to town casting out demons. And they come to a particular house a particular demon, and it says they sought to use Jesus' name in their incantation. And they got beaten out of the house. 
like the demon stripped him all naked and whipped him out of the house running. Declaring, I know who Paul is, I know who Jesus is, but I don't know you. Can't go into spiritual warfare on our own authority, thinking somehow we carry with us the power to overcome creation. We don't. They use Jesus' name in an incantation. They use his name as part of something. It can't be part of something. It has to be all of something. Jesus declares, I give you all authority. If you would use my name, you would have submission and obedience over demons. Now, all this is included in the Bible, which I'll be honest, about 15 years ago, if someone told me all this, I wouldn't believe them. Because I didn't believe the Bible, and I thought to myself, that's a nice idea. We're talking about 2,000 years ago. I want to share with you my experiences, my testimony and witness of demonic influence inside and outside of the church. And I want to share it with you not to be sensational and not to boast. If that comes across, something went really wrong. I want to tell you about the authority in Jesus' name. I've been in ministry and and been a part of deliverance ministry for the past 12 years. I've been involved in seven meetings in which we have led someone through deliverance. The first one really caught me off guard because it was my wife. I was a fairly new believer and something had happened to my wife. We'd had a really, really, really crappy first few years. But then it got worse and worse and worse. And I started to see some things in her that weren't her. I don't know if you've ever looked at someone and like, they're not in there. That's not them right now. I saw rage in my wife that I, I could not comprehend. Anger, hatred, fury to things that she loved. And so I went and shared this with my pastor, founding pastor of Epiphany Station. I, I walked up there and said, this is, I'm seeing this and I, I really don't get it. I mean, I am the perfect husband, so she couldn't possibly have... No. But I said, I could be wrong, but something seems up. And, and Jeff had actually been uh, becoming more exposed to demonic deliverance in his ministry. And he said, I was wondering when you would actually come and, and, and ask me these questions because I've seen it. And, and I wanted you to see it first. And so what happened is I went home and I said to my wife, I said, honey, Jeff says you got demons. Nah, I didn't do that. That would be dumb. Uh, But I did ask her about it and we did pray about it. And she actually did consider maybe perhaps, yeah. And so my first experience of deliverance was, was sitting in the living room of Jeff and Heidi Gauss with my wife and him walking her through deliverance. The identification of specific demons by name that were attached to her causing chaos and havoc, identifying the moment that they started and the reason and the purpose that if there was something that she needed to repent of or something that she needed healing from or something that she needed to break, that we would do that. And to hear demons cast out and to see my wife become who I married, to experience her once again, for her to gain freedom. Since then, I've been part of six more and some of them are planned Like, okay, I think this, I think I see this, let's pray about it, let's see if it's right, let's explore it, let's meet together, let's go through it. Some of them are very spontaneous. One happened in this very room during a worship experience in which the demon screaming and threw the guy to the floor. I've seen people who don't have Jesus twist and turn and convulse. I've seen unnatural head movement. I've seen eyes supernaturally glare. I've heard demons' names. I've heard specific orders that they've been given by Satan to steal, kill, and destroy. And I've seen them leave quietly, and I've seen them leave loudly. One particular moment that I have permission to share from a deliverance that was very recent was as we met, and as we prayed through, and as we cast out demons, there was one specific that was actually causing more difficulty to be identified than the rest. And upon casting it out, All the lights shut off in the house. All the power went out. I'm a naturally skeptical person. So I leant over to the owner of the house and said, you must have a lot of electrical issues. Yeah, like this happens a lot. Never, never. And so, okay, we knew what it was. This is disruption to seek to disconnect us from what was happening. And so we prayed. And when someone was done praying, someone said, and in the authority of Jesus Christ's name, 
All the power came back on, the lights came on, and we wept. We wept to know that God was good. We wept to know that he was all authoritative and powerful. Because I have seen in every deliverance, all demons submit to the name of Jesus. All of them. It's not a fight. It's not a contest. All you're doing is offering notification to the demon that he's done. That he can't be there anymore. All you're doing is you're sharing the woman who is oppressed. You are free. And we get to be part of plundering Satan's house. Yes, it happened 2,000 years ago. And it happened 12 years ago. And 7. And 3. And on October 11th. And on October 31st of this year. And get to experience life change. The things that God really wants for us. Peace because he's overcome the world. Joyful because our names are recorded in heaven. Some weep at being free. Some laugh at being free. But it is all so. We would be free. We would know the power and the authority of Jesus. So demons act and they behave. And then we bring Jesus to the table and they're done also, we would see that the kingdom of God has come amongst us. Back in Matthew 12, that's what Jesus said it was all for. If I'm casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. I must be stronger. There must be more strength in the Spirit of God than in anything else. And that's what God wants you to know. Who is stronger? Jesus Christ. Who gets the glory? Jesus Christ. Who brings the kingdom? Jesus Christ. Only Jesus and he chooses to have greater things happen than when he was on earth through his church by empowering them with the same authority to overcome evil. When it comes to overcoming evil in any of its forms, the most paramount, apex, zenith, most important thing is for us to believe in Jesus. Without belief in Jesus, there's there's no authority, there's no power. Yes, we will be overcome again and again and again and again. I would have you believe in Jesus more than I would have you do anything else. For when one person once saw Jesus perform a miracle, he said, Ah, I want to do the works of God. What do you want me to do? Jesus said, The only thing the Father wants from you is to believe in the one that he sent. It's the most important thing in overcoming evil that we believe in Jesus. That is what gives us authority and confidence to stand firm when, let's be honest, life is full of havoc and chaos. The next thing I want to teach you to do, the one thing I want you to be willing to do, is to identify demonic influence. If Jesus says it's real and that it happens throughout the world, and I share my experience with you, trust it or not, Are we willing to have our eyes opened by the Spirit and potentially see where it's happening? See, we as human beings, what we normally do is we identify everything by flesh and blood. Like if someone's acting a certain way, it's them. It's what's going on in them. If I am a certain way, it must be me. God says we have enemies. They're not flesh and blood. He would have you identify, yes, People can be sinful and evil. Yes, you have weakness and deficiency, but what if there is something else that so far in your life has been unovercomable? Can't do it on your own. Can't bust through it. Something consistently in your family, in your relationships, in which it's just irrational. It doesn't make sense. It's chaos. Would you be willing, would you have the courage to identify this could be demonic influence. Now, please, please don't go into every conversation thinking it's demons. Please don't quote me and say, Maddie thinks you got demons. Please don't do that. But please be willing and ready that if God would open your eyes, that you wouldn't dismiss it. That you wouldn't subtract from what he wants to do to bring himself glory because you're scared. But believe in Jesus. Identify demonic influence, and then exercise your authority. Authority in Jesus Christ's name. As a believer, as a bearer of the Holy Spirit, I am not one who can do this. We are all who are empowered to do this. Every single one of us have the empowerment to declare in Jesus Christ's name, demons are not welcome. In Jesus Christ's name, I am full. 
In Jesus Christ's name, I repent of the sin that gave foothold. In Jesus Christ's name, I offer forgiveness in the place where I am opening a door for the enemy. In Jesus Christ's name, we have real authority because that's what he would have for you. The knowledge and the practice of his authority because that would bring him great glory for you to experience it and praise his name. It's why we're here. We're here to love God and love people. We're here to love God by trusting him and letting him do through us what he would have get done so our faith would be strengthened and an unseen world would see authority. We're here to love people by actually offering them real, genuine, not thoughts and prayers, I'm sorry you're going through that. No, let's tackle the spiritual issue in your life together. Love God and love people. We're here for you as a church. God has developed this ministry amongst us so that we can take authority. I have a list of names of people who have walked in deliverance ministry, either as someone being delivered or someone exercising. If you feel at all that there could be something to explore about demonic influence in your life or the life of a loved one, then we are available to you. We will not force the issue. We will not demand, kick down the door and tell you what's going on, but you may invite us into it because we genuinely believe in the power and authority of Jesus' name, so we do not fear the encounter. As we wrap this thing up, I want to share with you from my favorite chunk of Bible, Philippians 2, I want to share with you the section of it that for me defines why we have confidence, why we exercise this authority, and what it is that we're really waiting for at the end of all things. In Philippians 2, starting in verse 5, it says, You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he, had a quality, though, he thought, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took a humble position of a slave. And was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore... God elevated him to the place of highest honor, gave him the name above all other names, and at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's real authority. That is why we are confident as overcomers of evil, no matter its form. So walk, if you can, in Jesus' name, and if you've not yet decided to put your faith in Jesus Christ as the power greater in your life. I'll be over in the prayer rooms. I'd love nothing more than to have the conversation with you about what that looks for. If you're not ready for it yet, head to the info desk, get you connected with one of our pastors. But have you know these things so you can overcome, so we can give God the glory when we see demons cast out and we see people living free. Let me pray. In Jesus' name, I, I thank you, Lord, that we can, do, will walk in your authority in the spiritual. That we need not fear the devil. We need not fear demons. We need not even fear sin. That we can have confidence as you as a patient and merciful God that you give us what we need to overcome every temptation, every oppression, and every influence. God, I ask you to secure your people by your spirit all the more. As things become more difficult, as temptations rile up, as addictions are fought, as rage is subdued and as sin is overcome and as demons are cast out, would you show yourself all the more real and all the more true through your power? Strengthen your church to truly believe what you say and show the rest of the world through a humility in your church that it is not us and that it is you Show the rest of the world through us what you do. Make us a generation that you can point to. And say, that's my power. God, I ask you to wipe clean the, uh, the lies that we have believed about the demonic, the, the personal thoughts, the, the foolish mentalities that we've had, or even just the dismissive nature we have towards it, and instead replace it with your word and truth, that we would genuinely believe what you believe and what you've told us. God, I ask that today not be a day of fear, but one of great joy, rejoicing in our names, 
being written in the, name, in the book of heaven. Walk us out of here in that authority to do you great glory. In Jesus' name, amen.